Uh, so, uh, this talk's going to be about some work um, that I've done with, with Stephen Dolan and Mathieu Pretner and Casey um, uh, on adding algebraic effects and handlers to a camel. Uh, it's kind of as part of the a camel multi-core project. So, I'm going to start with uh, an overview of what algebraic effects and handlers are, for those who aren't already familiar. Uh, then we'll look at how, how we implement them in a camel, and then the final part will be about um, adding an effect system to kind of track these effects at the type system level. So, algebraic effects and handlers, <clears throat> what are they? Well, um, so they were originally introduced uh, to study the semantics of, of computational effects as kind of like an uh, alternative to the traditional monadic approach there. And then with the, with the introduction of handlers, um, they kind of become an exciting new programming construct uh, for implementing such effects. Um, again, as a kind of alternative for, to monads for implementing effects in a pure language. So, uh, easiest thing to do is probably start with a simple example. So, um, I think probably the easiest way to think about uh, algebraic effects in terms of their runtime semantics is like an e exceptions that you can restart. So, uh, you've got kind of two, you've got two operations here. We've got uh, perform, and then we've got this extension of the match construct, which is for handling them. So it's a bit like a, um, perform's a bit like raise, and uh, the, uh, the handler's a bit like a, an exception handler. So, um, so this function's just gonna, it's gonna perform the get operation, then and add that to performing the get operation again, and then add two to it. And then we can run this thing inside a, a context where the get is being handled. Uh, so this, so in this first one, what's going to happen is um, when, when we get to perform get, it's going to jump down to this handler, which has both the get and also that k is a continuation. And so it's going to continue back where it left off with 9 as the result. So it's going to do that, then it's going to do that again, and in, in the end we get 20. Um, you could, do, you could run it under a different handler. This time it's, it's continuing with 99, and so the result is, is 200. One thing that's worth noting is that, um, so that, that continuation is, is, is um, going to continue the, you know, the rest of the expression inside the match, the rest of f applied to unit, and also the handler around it. So that second get is handled by the same handler as the first one. So that's called like uh, deep handlers, they're sometimes called in, uh, as opposed to shallow ones. So yeah, so that's how that works. Um, so yeah, so we've got these um, three basically uh, new expressions. You've got perform, which performs an operation E, possibly with a parameter. You've got this handle, which is going to handle E, possibly with a, its parameter and a continuation. And then you've got continue, which is going to continue a continuation with a parameter. Um, in a lot of treatments of algebraic effects, they just use like normal functions they just, for the continuation, but for reasons that will become apparent, we like separate them out into their own type and give them an explicit like apply, which is this continue op operation. Um, so, uh, in the like I said, in the first part of the talk, we're not going to be trying to track these effects in the type system, so the typing's very simple, really. Um, perform and continue are pretty much like applications, so you have an operate, you know, if the operation goes from A to B and you give it an A, you get a B. If the continuation is from A to B, you give it an A, you get a B. Uh, the match one looks more involved, but it's pretty much what you'd expect. So um, uh, all the things on the right of the arrows have type B under, in the context where X gets the same type as the expression and the, para you know, the parameter and the continuation get the types you'd expect. So I'm just going to kind of skip over that. Similarly, with the sem I have a kind of little semi-formal semantics written here, but as I said, it's best just to think of them like exceptions. So let's just move on to something more interesting. <laughs> right, some examples. <laughs> um, so we'll start with a very simple one. We've just got exceptions. So this is um, so we're gonna we've got one operation raise, and it's gonna it takes a string and it's gonna return you know any type at all because it's not actually gonna talk. Uh, it's not actually gonna return. Um, and you could run that by so you run f. In the, kind of, in the return case, you just return OK of that value. And if it performs a, a raise, raise operation with this message, we're just going to throw the continuation on the floor and return error of that message. So you can see how that gives you the same basic behavior as, as traditional exceptions. A more interesting example is state. Um, 
So now we've got two operations. We've got put and, and get. This is this is monomorphic integer state. So it's just so put is just going to take an integer and return unit, and get is just going to give you back an integer. Um, the implementation is, is much like the implementation of state as a monad. So um, basically, in the return case, you're just going to get a function that takes a state, ignores it, and just returns the value. Uh, in the put case, you get a function which takes a state, ignores it, and continues with the new state. And for get, you're going to get a function which continues with the state as its return value and, and leaves the state as it is, say, so KSS. A even more interesting example is, is, is choice. So we've got, a sing this is, we've got a single operation. It's just going to return a Boolean, yeah, true or false. And this, we've got two, two ways of running it here, two handlers. So run true is just going to always continue with true uh, whenever select occurs. But run all is more interesting. So in the return, so in the kind of when if f returns normally, you just get a singleton list containing that value. But when we get select, we're going to first continue with true, and then we're going to append that to the result of continuing with false. So what you're going to get in the end is a list of all the possible um, results that for all the different possible choices of select that could have been made. Um, yeah, so choice effect. So that's the kind of basic overview of, of algebraic effects, but uh, how we implemented them in a camel. So uh, first, in terms of how we define the effects, at the moment our effects are untyped, so there's no point trying to tie different operations to each other, so we just define them standalone. So it's a lot like an exception definition in, in, a, in a camel. Um, so yes, you have an effect get, an effect put, you just define them like that. And the additional thing we support is default handlers. So say this, this, you might have an effect called yield that returns unit, and you can give it a, a default handler that just returns unit. Uh, so what, that's, like putting a, that's like putting a handler at the very bottom of your program. So it's just kind of around the entire program. If there's not another handler inside it, then this is going to default to doing this thing, basically. And that's, I'll use that in a minute. Um, and the kind of other idiosyncrasy about our the, how we've implemented algebraic effects in a camel is that our continuations are, are affine. So you can not use them at all, or you can use them once, but you can't use them twice, um, which is different from most treatments of, of um, algebraic effects. So that lovely run all example I just showed you in a camel will not give you the uh, list of all possible results. It will give you this exception, uh, which is less useful, but there are some reasons for this. Um, so this was kind of three reasons. Um, so the first is, is kind of in terms of performance. When you, when you continue a continuation, you essentially use up the kind of stack that it represents. So if you allow people to use them multiple times, that means every time you continue, you need to make a copy of the stack and use that. And that copy is, you know, can be expensive. Um, the second reason is that this kind of thing makes uh, some reasoning more complicated, especially about resource usage. So, because what it means, if you can continue with this thing twice, it means you can call a function once and you can return from it twice. And there's a lot of a camel code out there that goes, you know, open file, call this function, close the file, and they quite reasonably expect that they're going to close the file as many times as they open it, not more times. Um, so I think it's, it's potentially a bit problematic to change that 25 years into the language's history. Um, and the other is that there are optimizations that a camel already does which are not safe in this, uh, with this kind of thing. They, so essentially, when you, when you, uh, if, you copy a st if you copy a continuation, you're essentially duplicating everything that's on the stack. So any optimization that moves things from the heap onto the stack stops being an optimization and starts just being changing the semantics. So, um, and a camel does that optimization. It's an optimi optimization we'd like to keep. It's a good good thing to do to move things from the heap onto the stack. So, um, so that was another reason that we decided to make these things affine. <coughs> so uh, in terms of implementation, we implement them in terms of what we have called fibers, which are basically just small um, heap allocated stacks, like very small, like maybe tens of bytes, and they dynamically resize as, they, as needed. Um, so 
essentially when you enter an effect handler, when you enter that kind of match with expression, you're going to create a new stack and start e and execute the expression on, on there. So you can see the stack pointers moved over there. And then when you perform an effect, what you're going to do is jump back to the previous stack and wrap that new that, that wrap that fiber up, and that's the that's your continuation basically. So very simple. Um, <clears throat> so there's yeah. So the way that's implemented is you have every every camel function checks there's enough room on its stack, and if there isn't, then it resizes the thing. Some simple static analysis eliminates like a lot of those checks. Um, there's also FFI calls are a bit more expensive because you kind of have to jump back onto the system stack to call C and then jump back, and so you're you're switching stacks rather than just doing a function call, which is more expensive, but it's not as expensive as you might think. Um, in fact, we we ran our kind of fiber-enabled runtime on a load of camel programs, which I can't read the names of, but it's about a percent slower. I think we could probably get that lower if we really pushed. It's um, so it's. That's not a, and I think that's a, a reasonable cost for having native support for these kind of control effects. And in particular, the main effect that th two, three of the collaborators on this work were mostly brought us to effects, which is concurrency. So, um, so yeah, I mentioned at the beginning that this was kind of part of the ACAML. Um, yeah. Can we ask questions? Oh uh, yeah, go on then. Uh, so, uh, do you want to get back? Oh yeah, yeah. A camel never takes addresses on the stack already, so we just don't have to worry about about that happening, basically. Well, that's yeah. So you can't run C on these fibers. You need to go over to the system stack for running your C, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but the, it, yeah, but it's fine. Um, Yes, so this it was part of the kind of a camel labs, uh, the camel multicore project. And so when we were doing the camel multicore project, we were keen to have some kind of native support in a camel for concurrency, um, because we didn't want there to just be the native support for parallelism. If you just have parallelism, not concurrency, people tend to confuse the two and you end up with horrible things like Java. Um, so we wanted something nice for doing that. Uh, but then we kind of came up against a problem, which is that writing a general purpose concurrent scheduler is really hard. Uh, like, and what most languages have when, with native support for concurrency is they have, they have a scheduler and it's baked into the language, it's baked into the runtime. It's, it's a complicated piece of code to, to, to get right and to be efficient for all the programs, and it has to be maintained by the language developers. And this was something we wanted to avoid. What we wanted instead was for people to be able to write their, write their own schedulers, because while writing a general purpose scheduler is quite hard, writing a concurrent scheduler that works well for, you, for one program is, is often quite an easy problem. Um, yes, yeah, so, right, so you wanted, wanted to have multiple schedulers, but once you've got people writing multiple schedulers, you, you don't want your library code to be tied to a specific scheduler. So, uh, yeah, you, if, you, if I write some code and it just uses read and write, I don't want it to, you know, I want it to be concurrent when people run it under, uh, with a specific scheduler, I, but I don't want it to have to be tied to one specific one. I want it to be essentially polymorphic in how those concurrent effects are being handled. And that's where algebraic effects come in, because they let you write code that just performs the reads and writes and things, and it can be run under any handler that, that handles those effects. And so that was the kind of angle that we were coming at. Uh, this work from. So I have like some snippets from a small concurrency scheduler we, we wrote to try and run a uh, web server, which doesn't work yet, so I don't have any performance numbers for you, but um, I thought I'd show some snippets anyway. So with so some basic concurrency, we're going to have like, we've got an async and an await uh, effects. That's much like async and await in many popular languages. Um, so basically, async is going to take a function, and it's, it's going to apply it and wrap up the results as a, as a promise. And await is going to wait for a promise to be finished. And then we've got uh, write and presumably other concurrent operations, read, accept, and so so forth, which take the arguments that, that they normally take. And um, with those, we've got a default handler. So what that means is that if you perform write 
without putting without having a concurrent scheduler. It just does the usual blocking write that Unix.write has always done. But if you run it underneath your you know, your scheduler, then it's going to do the nice the nice concurrent writes that you uh, the asynchronous writes that you probably want it to do. Yeah. They don't get a continuation. I didn't want to give them a continuation for the entire program. Uh, it's not entirely clear what that would mean as well. So, so you're basically assuming that it's payable. Yeah, basically, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah, some snippets of scheduler. It's a very simple scheduler we've implemented. Uh, just we've got a run queue, basically. If the run queue is empty and there are no reads and writes to do, then we're done. We just return unit. If the run queue is empty, but there are still some reads or writes going on, we you know call select, or well, more accurately, we go and call the function select that does the dance with epoll that you have to do to efficiently wait for reads and writes. Um, and if there's something on the run queue, then we just pop it off and run it. The, the queue is full of functions. Um, yeah, in terms of the like our promises, they're implemented very very simply as just references. So when you try and wait for so. So that's top function wait, you're, you're, ignore the state argument. You're waiting for a promise P, and you've got the continuation K, that's the thing waiting for the result. So, well, if P is done, just carry on doing K with the, with the value. But if P's not done, then just add K to the list of continuations waiting for this promise to finish. Um, and when you're finished with a, uh, when you're finished with the computation for a promise, you just set the value to done, and then take all those continuations on the list and shove them on your run queue, basically. Very simple scheduler. Uh, the actual scheduling function, the actual effect handler, uh, looks like this. I've left off the right case because it's not very interesting. Um, so we're gonna, we take a function and an argument. We're going to run the function. Um, oh, sorry, we take a function argument and a promise to put the value in. So when, when it's done, finish off the promise and then schedule something else to do. Uh, if someone asks you to execute something asynchronously, let's create, we create a new promise. We take what we were currently doing and put it on the run queue. And we, um, and then what we do is we loop back around into this handler to uh, run the function f with the value x, put it in the promise. So we basically can do that. And uh, await just calls that wait function that we had on the previous slide. Um, oh, if I can. The finish one? Yes? So doesn't this execute like when you start executing the queue, there's like another one waiting for the promise, and then it will be executed out of order, basically? Uh, is there another one waiting for that? I don't entirely follow you. Um, probably. It's not a particularly well written or thought through schedule. And also, I might have copied it down wrong. <laughs> um, anyway, this all gives you a, you know, a Vaguely simple interface for doing some some asynchronous programming. Got async and await functions, and uh, which perform the uh, corresponding effects, and as does the write function. And at the end, you have this this run function, which is just taking so it takes a computation that does some asynchronous things and runs it. Um, yeah. Right. Good. So that's kind of part one of the talk. Um, right. So. Obviously, one of the problems with these algebraic effects, much like with exceptions, is that you might attempt to perform one in a context where it's not being handled. Uh, you know, the classic unhandled exception runtime error that we all know and love. Um, so we would like to avoid that. <clears throat> and there have been systems around for many years that, that like, called uh, you know, type and effect systems that uh, Attempts to track these things, at the, things like this, at the type system level. I think they've got noticeably better in the last few years, and some of them have started to be genuinely usable. Um, thinking Coca, for instance, so um, and F as well. <clears throat> so we wanted to try and see if we could create such a thing for a camel, um, and in particular deal with the the backwards compatibility backwards compatibility issues that obviously result from that kind of change. Um, so. What is an effect system? Well, there is a big variety of effect systems, but they all look like at least a little like this. So fundamentally, you've, you're, you've got your A to B functions and are going to be marked by some kind of delta that represents what effects they might do. Um, 
and your lambda rule in the typing is basically going to, oh yeah, sorry, and also your typing judgment doesn't just say, you know, expression E has type B, but expression E has type B and performs effects delta. Um, and the lambda rule is going to move things from the right-hand side of the judgment up on top of the arrow, and the application rule is going to move them from on top of the arrow to the right-hand side of the judgment. Yeah, so we want something that looks a little like this. And in terms of requirements, like what requirements do we have for this system? Well, uh, we want it to be sound. So if we say that a program does effects delta, it better only do things from de represented by delta. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, it has to be useful. So I could just say that everything does all the possible effects, and that would definitely be sound, but it would not be useful. So roughly, we want to only annotate expressions with um, things that there's a reasonable chance they might actually do. Um, and backwards compatibility. We want everything that was typable in a camel right now to still be typable. In fact, I'd go further than that. It, it, it's got to be, things using effects need to be like interoperable. They need to be like compatible with things from the world before effects. We can't just like split the world into BE and AE and just never have them meet. These things really need to work with code that as it exists now. So with those requirements in mind, uh, consider this expression. So we have uh, if something, then perform E1, otherwise perform E2. Now our kind of usefulness, usefulness requirement uh, means that the perform E2, the E1 part, the, what that should be marked with is just E1. Um, whereas the perform E2 expression, that should be annotated as, as performing just E2. But the result is going to be performing like, E1 and E2, otherwise it's not, it's not sound. So you essentially have this, you, you need to be able to enlarge the effects essentially. So um, it's not enough to just say that those three are all equal. You want to, they need to essentially enlarge. And this is kind of two established approaches for this, getting this kind of flexibility. You have subtyping and you have row polymorphism. Um, so let's try those. Let's start with subtyping. So subtyping is kind of represented by the classic subsumption rule that if you have an A, and the, the subtyping relation tells you A can be used as a B, then you can use it as a B, um, which is very nice, but unfortunately it's very difficult to add something like that. Uh, full implicit subtyping to a language like a camel. It's very difficult. Um, so, a few reasons, but a camel has invariant type parameters, so not everything is co or contravariant. Things like the type parameter on ref or lots of things are invariant. And in the presence, especially, like, and Subtyping, especially in the presence of invariant type parameters, requires constrained types. So your types stop being this thing has A, and start being this thing has A and some stuff, which where the stuff is some set of constraints on the uh, on the free type variables in A. That are, um, and and that's that's quite problematic for a camel. So when you in particular, the module language doesn't like it. Like you have, if you've got, uh, when you're trying to check whether this module matches this signature, with constrained types, that ends up being, is this set of constraints an instance of that set of constraints? And that's very often a difficult problem. For some systems, it's just undecidable. Um, and in addition, it means that like users are gonna have to write out a set of constraints by hand on their signatures, which no one likes doing. And then the inference doesn't fit very well either, because inference for subtyping needs to be directed. You need to, um, be tracking the variance accurately, whereas a camel's inference is a kind of basically the traditional Hindley Milner, so it's kind of undirected unification. It's very hard to mix those two things. Um, so this is kind of out for us. So let's try row polymorphism instead. Uh, so in row polymorphism, you've got um, your delta is going to be a series of, uh, what have I gone with, eta. Eta is going to be my thing representing an effect. So it's like, um, so what we have here. And what these rules mean essentially is you get like a multi-set of eaters optionally with a with a row variable at the end. So um, so we don't yeah the, I think one of the rules says we don't the rules basically say we don't care about the ordering of the of the eaters, um, but we do care about how many they are. So multi-set of eaters optionally terminated by a, a variable. Hmm? Do I mean epsilon? I, I do mean epsilon. I don't understand why eta looks like an n. It, it's just wrong. Okay. Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, so um, with rows, the typing of like perform starts to look like this. Um, so if E is an effect in epsilon um, from A to B, then basically, uh, basically the trying to perform it is going to have epsilon in its in its row. It's going to have closed row with epsilon, and then 
some delta. And when you kind of do inference and you get the most general type that this rule could um, could generate, those deltas are going to become row variables, and so you end up with types that's, that look a bit like this. Um, so that raise function, which just raises something, is string to unit, where the uh, where the arrow is doing exception or ex exn and um, some row variable. I'm using exclamation mark to mark row variables on, instead of uh, apostrophe in our syntax. Um, yes, so that's good. And similarly, match. Uh, well, the important thing about match is that in the top left there, we have epsilon and delta, whereas the match itself just gets delta. So we're kind of taking that effect out of the multi-set of effects. And the most general type that you get from the rules like that starts to look like, things, starts to look like this. So this is the running function for exceptions. So you take a, a unit to alpha that does exception and some stuff, then it does some stuff and gives you an alpha string result. So you can see what the variable is, is meaning there. Um, and that so that so the row polymorphism works in terms of a camel's inference. It, it, it mixes nicely with the inference, but there's still like an issue for us here. And the issue comes when you when you try and think about. So we know what to do with these arrows with effects in them, but what do we do about the traditional arrow, the arrow that every camel program uses at the moment? What does that mean? So uh, first thought might be, well, let's have it be the empty row. So just arrow does no does no algebraic effects. Um, but that gives us some problems with examples like this. So we've got this old function that's been lying around for centuries, and we are going to use it in the new shiny world of effects. Um, we do it on one side of an if, and on the other side we try and perform a get, so from state, I assume. Um, and that's going to produce this error. And, and the problem is that um, so the function. Uh, the problem is that we've got a we've got no row variable in there. If we have it be the closed one, there's no variable, so it can't unify with this state, yeah, like you can see that um, it's closed with IO. Um, yes, so having arrow just be closed and using row polymorphism is not going to let us interoperably use old stuff with effects. Another thing you might try is to say, well, in that case, we need a variable. Let's make the arrow be the row with a single variable in. But you can't do that either because now you've changed what was a monomorphic type into a polymorphic type. and things care about whether types are monomorphic or polymorphic, this would stop working. Uh, because now a camel is like, well, what happened? what's that type parameter doing there? Um, that where R is the hidden one that we've put inside the arrow. So that doesn't work either, and we find ourselves a little stuck. Um, so what's the solution? So what we're essentially going to do is we're going to take a little sprinkle of subtyping and <laughs> sprinkle it over our row polymorphism system, enough to essentially address this problem, but without giving us all the problems that we talked about with subtyping. And the way we're going to do that, it's a, it's a variation on a trick borrowed from, from Coca, is that, um, so what, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to say that the arrow is the closed one, but when you instantiate, so when you use an identifier, we're going to go down all the covariant pla uh, places in that type, in the known parts of that type, and uh, find any closed rows, and we're just going to stick variables in them, basically. And that's a, that's a valid subtyping coercion. Like we could write that out explicitly as a coercion, um, but we're going to do it automatically. Um, yes, it's basically it's quite natural, really. Like the variables in row polymorphism, at least the ones that are free, are pretty much just an approximation for variance. So when we know the actual variance, we can just fix it up and make it the right thing. Um, and so that looks like typing rule something like this. So this is our, our new instantiation rule. So we have these kind of for all some type variables and some effect variables as A, and we're going to call this open thing on A to get some even more type variables and then substitute a lot of them. Um, we're open, so we've got open plus or minus because we're tracking the variance as we go down the type. And the only interesting thing open does is that in a covariant position, if it sees a closed row, puts a, puts a fresh variable in it. Yeah, and so that lets us now. Our, now this this difficult example types without any issue, which is nice. And in fact, uh, in addition, now that we're opening up, we're now we're going to insert all these type variables in every time we instantiate. We can also take a ton of them out when we when we generalize because we know they're going to come back again as soon as we instantiate. So we have like a corresponding close operation. So this is on this is the rule for generalizing, um, where this 
yeah, basically this closable and closed thing, it's going to find any variables that are not mentioned contravariantly, and it's just going to unify them with uh, empty, because those variables will always come back again when we instantiate. Um, and the point of doing this is just to make the types look nicer, unlike the open is necessary for this, uh, to get things to type check. This is just about um, making things look nicer. In particular, that raise function that we had, where we used to have that little row variable that didn't really tell us anything that wasn't already in the type, we now get just, you know, raise is unit to int does exception. No variable needed. Um, so, that's nice. Yeah? Isn't that like I'm leaving out some subtlety as to wh when I go down things, um, but it's basically only the bits that come from other lets or from annotations, so it's not. Right, because if it's just the unit Yeah, if it's just randomly, then yeah, it would be. So it depends on which corner you actually check things. Yeah, it, yes, it would. But no, it doesn't, because I, I do a cleverer thing than what I said I did. Um, but <laughs> so, okay, so, I'll do, so you can think of instantiation and generalization as like you kind of mark the variables at, at generalization that are free, and then in instantiation you, you know, copy those ones that have been marked. And you can extend that to just kind of like all the types, essentially marking the ones that come, uh, the, one, the, ones, the parts of the type that come from other lets or that come from the expression itself rather than those that are being used elsewhere. And a camel just does this anyway as part of type checking because that's an efficient way to implement generalization. So I have that lying around and I just only go down the variants and only look at those things which have been marked as that. And so it's vaguely principle, basically. Right. Um, yeah. Um, oh, right. So now we have a type system that vaguely works. How do we use it? So we've got um, the Definitions for effects are now like this in the type. So in the type version, they look like this. We define an effect called state with two operations, get and put, with the types that you might expect. We also have a special syntax for, the, this is like an exception one. So it doesn't give you, if you try and use failure, you don't get a continuation, which means that you can basically just use this like an exception, except now it's tracked in the type system, so it's better. Um, yeah, so that's good too. And we've gone to all this trouble to have, to like make an effect system to track all these effects. We might as well make a camel of pure functional language. Um, like, if we're going to, you know, do that anyway. So, and that's pretty easy at this point, but you just, you define an abstract effect called IO, um, which has a default handler, and you find all the operations in a camel that perform side effects, and you say they do IO. Um, and then we make the normal arrow mean the, the effect that does IO, so everything's still backwards compatible. Um, I'm going to use the Haskell definition of purity here, so we don't check for divergence or raising exceptions. So not proper purity, but still a very useful definition. Um, right, so, yeah. If you write just the normal error in the panel, yep. you assume it's like I.O. Yep. And how do you write something where you say, oh, no effect at all? Well, uh, well, you could write, hang on. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> um, right. Okay, so the first thing for usability is we have a few shorthands um, because they're good. Um, right, uh, so normal arrow that is just the arrow that does IO. We have this kind of arrow with a double head is the arrow that's doing nothing. And then we have these two other shorthands where, so like the double arrow with tilde is just a, a function performing a single row variable called tilde. And the other one is the kind of the same, but with I/O stuff stuffed in. And the, the reason we have these two is that the vast majority of types that you write have a single row variable, like by far. In fact, there's a language Frank where that's like its whole thesis that there's just a single row variable. Um, we don't go that far, but we do have, have these syntaxes for writing the shorthands, um, the shorthands for writing that form. And that means that the so here is here's like list dot map and array dot map, and they're types in this with these shorthands, and you can see that relatively succinct. You've got, um, you know, map is a, you know, takes a function um, that does some effect, then does no effect, uh, then takes a list and does the effect that the function put in. Um, yeah. And then array is the same, except it also does IO because arrays are mutable. Um, yes, so that's, that's, those shorthands are very useful. And so in an attempt to like vaguely objectively measure whether this system is usable, I converted the whole standard library to be like effect aware. So it's not actually doing any effects at this point, it's just all the functions are now correctly marked as pure or impure, and the higher order ones are appropriately passing through their, their, um, their effects. 
So that's like, it ends up being about four and a half thousand changes out of 24,000 lines. Um, about half of which are just changing the value specifications of things. So like the map becomes like this, which is a fairly mechanical procedure really. Most functions go, they, they take a load of stuff, some of which might be higher order, and then they do it all at the end. Uh, so you can pretty much do them without, I just wrote them all without looking at the implementations. And then when I was wrong, the type checker told me off. So um, uh, yeah, and it's worth saying that so in all of those changes, I didn't have to write a single explicit row variable. Those, those four shorthands were enough to express everything in the standard library. Um, or like everything except for the complicated cases I'm about to show, because we have, yeah, so that's two, thousand, two and a half thousand of the lines. Uh, then 200 lines were getting rid of polymorphic comparison. The camel has this horrific non-parametric polymorphic comparison that it does, and that's impure because it just goes into whatever it likes and tries to look at it, and it might be mutable, we don't know. So I had to replace a load of those with nice monomorphic pure versions of, of the comparisons. There's a, there's a fair few of those lines like that. Then I had, uh, I had some things, yeah, with set and map. So I wanted to make set and map pure, but and you think, well, set and map, they're obviously pure, but actually, because they have a comparison function that comes in, and for backwards compatibility, I have to assume that might do I.O., uh, I needed to make new versions of them for that. They share the implementations, but like, it's essentially making a functor that's polymorphic in an effect, and the syntax and that is still quite awkward. I, I think it maybe needs a bit of work. But there's, so there's some boilerplate around that, and that, that gave me some extra stuff. Then we had a big chunk of ch changes that are just trying to put a, a effect parameter on format strings. So, um, all right, so first let's describe the problem. So format strings, so format strings in a camel are actually like in modern camel, a syntactic sugar for constructors from a huge and co very complicated list of like mutually recursive GADTs that represent the many, many, many features that formats have built up over the years. Um, so what they essentially do is, as you use these GADTs, it's going to construct this like type with loads of arrows in. That's like, what are the arguments this format expects, and then it's going to return it. But so because it's used for both printf and scanf, and because it's a GADT, that those the where we're building those up is in an invariant position. It's not covariant. So our, our lovely opening trick that we're doing to fix up the arrows and put variables in stops working in that uh, for, for those. So the solution to that is basically just to give these formats and effects parameter, and then now the arrows that we build up have an effect variable in them and, and everything works out nice. But that means I have to go through all the GADTs and add this parameter to them. And because it's GADT code, there's like hundreds of type annotations in the code that uses them. They also need to be adjusted. So that ends up being about half the changes to do that. That was fun. Um, <laughs> And then two type annotations. That's, that's what we needed in the end. They're actually right next to each other. These aren't two different diffs. A, that's the whole diff. Um, uh, in both these cases, essentially what we've got is a uh, non-polymorphic thing. So you're, like neither of those are values, so we haven't generalized them. Um, and they have arrows in invariant positions. Uh, and so, and they, yeah, they get used in different contexts. And what we need to do, so in the first one, we just, we close it, uh, and that's enough to fix the problem, because then we get the opening subtyping that fixes it. So we, the type annotation, and in the second one, I just made it be a value, so it would be polymorphic, and that fixed it. Um, in both those cases, it would actually have been easier, probably, to add a subtyping, explicit subtyping coercion. It would have been, like, longer, but uh, easier to see how to do that. So yeah, in both of those, you could have just done explicit subtyping. Yeah, but yeah, so anyway, the whole standard library, there's only two places where the opening isn't good enough for us to, yeah, and we actually need to do some subtyping, basically. Um, how are we doing? Yeah, I've got time for this one as well. Right, so that's, that's a fairly good look at usability, but it does, since we actually haven't done any effects, I thought that we, I, I, it's not quite uh, a fair look. So what I've done is also uh, gone through the standard library, and I've just got rid of the not found exception and replaced it with an effect. Obviously, it has to be an exception one, because those are the only things that currently exist that are like effects in a camel. Yeah, and I mean, that's a good thing to do, replacing it with effect. That means that if you don't handle it, you'll get a type error at, at compile time. So it's, 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 it's what you want. Um, and so I went through and made that. The, about 300, ends up being about 300 lines of changes, the majority of which are just changing it from an uh, you know, changing it from an exception to an effect, and updating the types so that they now tell you um, yeah, they now tell you uh, that that these things do the effects. We notice now we are now kind of now we need an explicit effect parameter. Yeah. So why did you uh, not use a tilde? Uh, oh, we could have done, but it wouldn't have made it. Uh, it would have just looked the same. It would have been in the same place as the p. Can't, can't use a tilde arrow. 
Like, but that's but that but I need the not found in there as well. I haven't got a thing that does like tilde with not found. I well, yeah, I I may well add tilde with not found so that you can. Well, I bow to your superior shorthands. Um, <laughs> Yes. Anyway, so mostly it's the simple stuff. Um, but I also have to add some handlers in because there are some places where uh, the standard library just happens to know uh, that there won't that the if, that not found is never going to be raised. Of course, this is also probably still an improvement because now when those when it knows that wrong, when it's wrong about its assumptions, we'll now get an assertion that tells us where it happened rather than just like not found, um, which is good. We needed one type annotation more than before. Uh, Similar to the last one, we've got a, it's this time a big recursive function, so um, not polymorphic, the ver of the type that we had. Um, we're essentially this, this thing is used polymorphically recursively in terms of effects, because it's used in one place with not found and one place without not found, and polymorphic recursion needs type annotation, so uh, added some type annotation. Isn't this an exception? Do you allow exceptions? I allow exceptions in pure code for reasons like this. <laughs> And I needed two coercions for this set and map thing. Um, this is essentially because of the, the sharing of implementation using functors means we don't get to do the opening trick, basically. I'm not going to bother explaining the syntax and things because I'm going to make it better. Um, but yeah, so essentially we're forced to use explicit subtyping there because the opening can't be used inside the functor. Um, cool. So. Oh yeah, and one last little bit of usability is just like that, that code I showed earlier for concurrency effects. How does that look with types? So I split them into uh, two uh, effects. We've got async and AIO. The AIO ones get a default handler, uh, whereas the async ones don't. Um, and the async input type is now marked as like, obviously it takes a function that can do AIO, async, or IO as its input. And the interface. So the interface looks like this. We get async. It's like you do. Yeah. Uh, async and await both perform the async um, effect. Write performs the AIO effect. And this run function takes something doing async, AIO, and some IO and gives you something that's just doing IO instead. Um, and so this starts, to, this starts to be a fairly reasonable replacement for the kind of things that people use LWT and async for in a camel. So um, like monadic concurrency, you get a similar situation where you can see from the type where your concurrent code might um, context switch, right? Like you can see if it does async or AIO, then it could context switch. If it doesn't, then it's not going to. And that's a valuable thing to have. So it's, it is much nicer with the effects tracked. Oh, no? Oh, the with function is like it's, it's like it's got a default handler, but I'm, like that's the signature version of has default handler. It lets the type system know that you can do it at the top level without having to be an error. Sorry. The syntax is terrible because I didn't want to add a new keyword um, and have to go through and remove all the uses of the word default from the compiler. <laughs> right. So far, all sounds very good. We have this effect system that's tracking these powerful algebraic effects. Everything is wonderful. Um, but there are obviously still a few like challenges and some issues that need to look to address. The first is about our decision to make uh, continuations affine. So you have these continuations. If you use it the first time, everything's fine. You use this again, it's going to raise an exception. So our continuations are mutable, um, which means that when you create them and when you continue them, that has to be an IO because it's not pure. Um, so essentially, I have a situation where my effect handlers are impure, um, which is still very usable, but it is kind of annoying because now you've split the world into two. You can either track your purity or you can use algebraic effects and track your effects, but you can't really do both at the same time at the moment. Um, there's a few possible solutions to this. Um, so one would be to review the decision to make them affine. Um, some of the problems I was talking about have gone away a little bit by having types, like the reasoning is maybe okay because you can see they're there. But um, uh, the other, other things I'm interested in looking at for this. Um, so one would be to have some simple linear types. Like uh, I'm not talking like a full-blown Rust system, but uh, the manipulations you do on continuations are normally relatively simple, and so some very primitive support for linear types would be enough to make them pure. Another, another option might be to do something a bit like the ST monad in, um, in uh, Haskell. So it's some way to like, like show that the continuation is never escaping, which you could also do with, with the effects, basically. And um, then it becomes pure, and you can mix and match the two. Um, yeah, but anyway, that's something that I, we will be looking at. Um, 
Wait, oh, oh, this example shows that it's impure, but I felt it was obvious, so I didn't explain it. Yeah? So, uh, the, the worst that can happen is that you get an exception at runtime. Do you use the continues? Well, you can change the semantics. So this program, like, so you've got this f, which does, a, which has a handler, and if you didn't treat it as pure, you might go, oh, I could replace, you could replace f with just reusing the result from the last time. But this example shows that that changes the semantics. So it basically breaks pure, right? You can't, you can no longer, like it's a reasonable thing to do to say, I've got a, one function, a pure function computing result, another call to the same pure function with the same arguments. Why bother calling it again? Just reuse it. That optimization would be completely. I don't see why Oh well, now it's gonna. Oh, it's gonna raise an exception. Are you just saying that you can only observe it in I/O? Oh, right, right. So in this case, there will not be an exception. Ah, uh, in the other case, there would. Yes, ah, yes. Yeah. And if I caught that and did something weird, yeah. I mean, like no sensible program is gonna have this problem, but still. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I. I yeah. I think we can solve it, but yeah, it needs needs to be looked at. So another thing is you can't have, you can't you can't do what I've done on the top line there. Basically, you can't have a parameter on an effect. So one thing you might want is a polymorphic state effect, which like like this one at the top, um, and uh, so that we you know so here I've got a fold. I'm implementing fold in terms of iter basically by using a polymorphic state. And you can't do that because of reasons I'll tell you in a second. There is something you can do. You can lo make a local effect. So we move the effect declaration inside the function. And that's fine. But again, as with the other thing, creating an effect, you're not creating something mutable, but you're creating something that has a notion of identity. So it's generative. So again, that's, that's impure. Um, I had an example that showed that, but I took it out because it was just gratuitous. Um, so, yeah, so that's a sh so you, there's a way around it, but you, it sticks you in I/O, which is a pain. Um, to see why you can't have effects with parameters in this case is um, it's because of abstraction. So let's say I had that effect. Oh, I renamed it state, didn't I? Well, okay, this is fold two. It's like state two, let's say, um, which is inside inside the structure. Fold fold two is equal to fold, so it's equal to the other effect. Um, and we provide a way to perform an int fold2, but we hide the fact that fold2 equals fold for the outside world. So that means that in the outside world, you don't know that, you don't know that an int fold2 should not be mixed with a string fold. Like, there's no way of like, precisely deciding inequality in, in, in a camel for things with, when you have proper abstraction, you just can't decide it. Um, so yeah, so if you kind of did it the naive way, you'd end up allowing programs like this that mix an int fold2 with a string fold and promptly segfold. Um, yeah, and so that's that's the problem is that yeah you just really can't have and uh, you can't yeah the effects rely on being able to decide some notion of inequality and you can't combine that if you have abstraction you can't then have parameters to do that. Um, <clears throat> a possible solution to that is so basically if we we if we, we can't have abstraction parameters maybe we should just get rid of the abstraction part of that. Um, well, and, and that's like, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what we want to do. But uh, everything nominative in a camel has, is abstractable. It's like the module system vaguely relies on it. You can't really have a, a, a nominative thing that's not abstractable. But we can switch to a structural version of this. So that would look something like it, this example in the middle. So you kind of, you just perform get and, now, and get is in the type. That's like a structural type for the get effect. Um, so we didn't predefine it anywhere. There's not some state thing with a name. There's just you happen to be doing a get, um, and that would allow parameterized effects. Um, and I think is is something I'd like to look at. Uh, there are some issue issues. So um, we were using abstraction to do our I/O effect. We need to have some alternative mechanism for making an effect that you cannot actually catch or perform, um, but you can see in the type um, and default handlers and things like that. So there's some issues uh, that need to be like thought about but I think this is a promising direction to go in so yes so um, I, I th so algebraic effects and handles are a good mechanism for modeling effects um, you can use them to effic uh, efficiently and composably implement your own concurrent schedulers in the language rather than having to bake in a scheduler which is good if that's something you're interested in and um, 
yeah, you can use effect systems to manage algebraic effects and side effects more generally. And finally, it is possible to create an effect system that is both usable and backwards compatible with an existing language like a camel, which is a thing I don't think I, I knew a year ago, but it can be done. <laughs> so, um, uh, yes, any more questions? I'd do subtyping. I'd really do subtyping. You would do subtyping. Yeah, I would do it like how. Well, okay. So I, this line of people like know, but, but Stephen Dolan's approach to subtyping, I would do that basically. Um, uh, yeah, and that would make that, that was the. I mean, yeah, the fitting that that rope polymorphism subtyping issue was the hardest bit of retrofitting it into a camel. I think that, that yeah. So I'd do subtyping. Andreas. So I, I can see why you like, leave out exceptions um, for backwards compatibility, but if that was an issue, so if you were starting from scratch, it would be possible to make it usable. I think, yeah, yeah, I think, I don't know. I think if you're not in the like dependently typed language, it seems a bit awkward to, to like always prove your exhaustiveness. Your exhaustiveness. I'm picturing like a match where I just can't quite convince the compiler that this thing isn't here and I have to assert false. That's the only case that worries me. So if your type system is more sophisticated, then I think that becomes, e that becomes fine. Uh, I think, but Dan is going to disagree or? No, I, I, I didn't hear the Oh, oh it, it, the question, so the, ah, right, I'll repeat the question. The question was, um, so you can see how I for backwards compatibility, I leave exceptions out of, out of the, the uh, IO effect, but if it wasn't, if I was starting from scratch, would I put it in? And I think I, I would if I felt the type system was uh, able to detect exhaustivity well enough that I didn't need to put the occasional assert false in places. Um, so yeah, so in a dependently typed language, definitely yes, in the, maybe not if I didn't have that kind of power. Oh, I could, yes, yeah, splitting the I.O. effect up into multiple things is quite possibly something we should be doing. At the moment, I just shove it all in one because I, I did, but, yeah. Uh, I saw a sort of hand. No, has it gone down again? Maybe. Oh. No, one of you. Uh, ML style state. ML style state. So being able to have a polymorphic view of Oh, do you, do you mean the, sorry, do you mean the same as, do you mean this thing, or no? Oh, I want new as well. You want new, oh, so you want the one like ST, basically. Yes. Uh, you could do it like ST, if you had a parameter. You can actually do it like ST without a parameter, but you have to like do a functor and it's, it's horrifically verbose. <laughs> um, well, if yeah. you're doing a handler, then it becomes interesting. Implementing the handler that does it. Oh yeah, I'm talking about like a built-in one. I don't know how you can do it as yeah. a handler. Yeah, I think maybe you need to have, so I think looking at some of the issues with the continuations and things, I think that tracking effects is not sufficient for really doing nice, I think you want to track some form of linearity as well, basically, um, until you have that. I think you can't have a complete story for, for these kinds of things, um, like some languages do. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Maybe I have a question also. Do you use any properties of the effect types? The uh, uh, no, so one that I haven't, I was going to try and implement it this week and I didn't do is I, getting rid of the value restriction is going to be it's high on my list because obviously if it doesn't, if you don't perform any effects, you, you can generalize. Um, in fact, one of the two type annotations I had to add would have gone away if I'd implemented that, but I haven't done that. And yeah, no, no optimizations as of yet, but it would be easy to plug it in. Uh, so the new, uh, the new optimization framework that Camel has called F Lambda has a notion of effect, which is really primitive to like, try and find things that are pure, uh, this would help. So yes. Um, Dan? Last one. Yeah. Uh, super impressive work. Thank you. Oh, I, I, I don't think it's impossible for it to be in the current ECAML uh, in a certain amount of time. It just, uh, I think those issues need resolving, um, and then a lot of people need persuading, but um, I don't think it's impossible. I mean, it's backwards compatible, right? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, it is on the internet. Um, <laughs> just, like, find me on GitHub and then just explore the many wonderful ECAML things I've done, and one of them will be this. 
I, I'll try and, yeah, I will put it somewhere more prominent and you'll be able to find it. Yeah. All right.